always love that view here from the Big A of the Empire State Building. One of the first clear days that we've seen in quite a while at the Ozone Park racetrack. Well, we want to welcome you to this edition of Aqueduct Insider on this Friday. Not your usual scene, not your usual duo here, but Maggie Wolf, no filling in, as well as Andy Sterling alongside for this insider, Andy, and only seven days left in the 2014 racing calendar. They also announced new dates in 2015. Yeah, they did. The dates are out, so I don't know what they are, but they have announced the dates for 2015. I do know that Saratoga, I think, starts around July 24th and ends as it always does at Labor Day, but it's easy to count backwards from that. But, of course, looking forward to all that stuff in 2015. And that's always the important one, at least. So for more dates, check out Naira.com. But tomorrow, the more pertinent information is the Queens County Stakes. Andy and David Jacobson, a well-known guy, especially around here at Aqueduct is going to send out two horses, one of them being a little bit stronger of that duo. Yeah, I think the real question, you know, with David Jacobson's the, the shorter price one, Storm right. Monarco, is whether or not he can reproduce his good form in New York. He, he's run okay in New York. Just seems to be a horse with his last win coming at Penn National. He had a win, I think, before that down at Laurel. Mm -hmm. Those races seem a little bit better than the ones he runs in New York. And I'll tell you something, this Queens County came up a pretty tough race, and he's going to have to run one of his A races to get it done here. Yeah, exactly. It's a deep field. A lot of horses with some stakes, a uh, quality record. So we'll see if Storm Monarcos can bring the goods. But Actually, our uh, employee or our co-host, Richard Migliori, caught up with David Jacobson to see what he thinks about Storm and Monarcos. David, you have two horses entered in the Queens County. Are you planning on running both of them? Right now, yes. The answer is yes. Storm and Monarcos has run some giant races out of town. His form in New York maybe hasn't been quite as good. Do you have anything you attribute that to? Well, the, the spots that we picked out of town were a little bit easier than, you know, oh, usually easier than New York. Um, but he's just really, really good now, and uh, I expect him to give it a grade-A performance. In a mile today should really suit him. Oh, perfect, perfect. I mean, you know, Rudy's got a nice horse in there, that Vijack, and I'm uh, just hoping that Storm Monaco might be a little better going a mile and an eighth than Vijack. And uh, you got Wealth to Me, who hasn't run in this kind of company before, but he seems like he's in good form as well. Yeah, he's really sharp. We really don't have any place to run him, so we're going to consider it. I'll discuss it with, uh, you know, add it over at Drawing Away, and, uh, and then we'll decide with Wealth to Me. Right now, Storm Monarco is definitely running, and Wealth to Me is a little bit of a question mark, but we'll, we'll decide the morning of the race. Thank you. Good luck. Okay, Rich. Thanks. Well, we got to thank Richie for that brief piece with David Jacobson in regards to his two here, Andy. And Storm Monarco, yes, of the two kind of favorites going in, he seems like the one more suitable to the mile and a distance, what David said. What do you think? Oh, yeah, I, I, he's just a better horse. He? I mean, I don't think Wealth to me has a real problem with the distance. He's just probably a little slower than these horses. Well, I mean, Vijack, actually. Well, oh, Vijack? Yeah. Um, yeah, and it does sound like David's. I, I'm going to guess Walt to me is going to come yeah. out of there talking about what he talked about. Vitek's a very good horse. Listen, he was third in the Wood Memorial. It's not as though he hasn't run well enough in a mile and eighth before. I don't like it, though. I, I'm not so sure why. I mean, I understand he's a gelding. They're going to leave him here. But I'm not so sure why they're stretching him out again. To be honest with you, I might give him a little break and be looking for some race down the road. But maybe their feeling is they'll give him this one race, see how he does in here. And if not, they'll give him a, a little bit of a break because it seems like they should be looking at races like the Carter and the Met Mile. Whether or not he's good enough remains to be seen. But his one-turn sprints are better races for him. I agree with you wholeheartedly there. But we'll get a little more in depth with race number eight, the Queens County a little later on in the show, but we have to get to today's second race, which, Andy, we saw a great matchup of some talented two-year-olds here. Johnny I has a call of this maiden special weight. Madrus from the inside, hustled out for the lead. Net gain was away well, far from over. Now moves up in between horses. Then it's Fowler Avenue, who's down towards the rail and running in fourth. Titanor on the outside in fifth, and Tensendur is the trailer. Madrus is the leader. Madrus three quarters of a length. Far from over. Runs in second. Fowler Avenue down on the inside is third by a neck with net gain on the outside in fourth. And the opening quarter was running 23 and four fifth seconds. And the field has reached the back stretch. There goes far from over. Now to take over the lead from Madrus. Far from over. Half length. Madrus to his inside and Titanor to his outside. Net gain is running in fourth. Now four lengths from the lead. Tensendor and Fowler Avenue 
is the trailer with a half mile to the finish, and the opening half was running 48 and three. Madrus coming back again on the inside of Far From Over. So the two of them hook up as they go into the far turn. Titanor is third. Net gain just in behind. Net gain will need some racing room. There goes Tensendor with a four wide move, and Fowler Avenue with a five wide move as the field comes for the top of the stretch. It is wide open. Three quarters in one. 14. Far from over. Madrus. Now there's racing room for net gain, and here he comes on the outside. Far from over and net gain. And those two are together. Then Tensendur and Madrus. Far from over. Digging in at the rail. Net gain on the outside. These two battle it out to the finish line. A head bob could go either way. Far from over or net gain. And a tenacious performance first time out here from far from over from the Pletcher Barn. Pretty hefty price as a yearling, 550000 here, Andy. What did you think of the move down the backside with him kind of going to the lead after a quarter in 23 and 4? Well, I thought he ran very well in here. I mean, it was a reasonably quick first quarter, and I think that Arad probably knew he had a horse, and he didn't want to let Madrus get, get an advantage from because going in, you're talking about a horse that was a short price, and he didn't want to allow that horse to dictate. So it turned out he didn't have to worry about him. I'm a big fan of net gain going into this race, and I mean, Arad, or, I mean, I'm sorry, Jose Ortiz gave him just an absolutely yeah. perfect ride. I mean, talk about getting your position going forward, made the move, tucked him in behind was patient, angled out, and unless the four far from over turns out to be a stakes horse, I don't want the six net game going forward, because even if he was the second best horse in the year, I think he was supposed to win the race with the trip he got, and he just hung down the stretch. He really did. Yeah. I love far from over going in, at least looking at him physically, and I thought I was definitely beat by net gain, who, as you said, did not have much in the lane. Yeah, I mean, listen, to be fair, they put a lot of distance between themselves and the others, mm -hmm. and you do want to see the figs, and you want to take a look at the race and not be unfair because maybe Far From Over is a very good horse. But unless it turns out he's pretty good, Net Games feels like one to me. I'll be looking to play against the short price next time. All right. Well, one that may have had a blowout performance in the fourth went off as your favorite was one for Mike Hush in Global Positioning. Did he answer the call? We'll find out as we'll check out race number four, New York Breds, two-year-olds, and Johnny I once again with the call. And the rough... Andrews got zip. Global positioning from the rail. Global positioning takes the lead. Andrews got zip in second. Posse Man is on the outside in third. Then can't get wise to me. Down on the inside. Followed by Summerhawk, who's racing in fifth. Copernicus is sixth. Damage control in seventh. David Rocks runs in eighth and it's four lengths to Organic Gemini, who trails the field in ninth. And the first quarter was run in 23 and one fifth seconds. And global positioning leads by two lengths. Andrews got zip in pursuit in second. Can't get wise to me. Dropping back towards the rail. Passed now on the outside by a posse man. Coming for the head of the stretch, global positioning by three over Andrews got zip. Half mile in 46 and four fifth seconds. Global positioning now by four. Andrews got zip in second as Summerhawk moves up into third. Then it's Posse Man and damage control. Global positioning with a big lead here as they come down for the wire and global positioning will break his maiden and do it by six lengths. Summer Hawk up for second. Andrews got zip was third. Andy, he didn't offer much value, but global positioning won like a three to five shot should. Yeah, he did, Maggie. You know, I, I thought he was over bet going in. And not that I would deny he was the worst to beat and you know, thought he was very much, but uh, three to five seems a little short. And, you know, even though he won, I'm still not sure it wasn't. But as you say, he did win like a three to five shot should. So who am I to knock the price he was? He was impressive in winning this race. I do wonder about some of the others behind him, though. Yeah, I do, too. I mean, Summer Hawk, we've seen what he can give, and it's just that much. Yeah, I mean, they didn't run that much faster than the first race. And I know that those horses are, you know, they're three-year-old fillies and such, but they're they're claiming horses are going to run figures in the 60s. So I don't think this came up a super fast race. But with my caution, she certainly could move forward. Yeah, exactly. A Malibu Moon son there for Mike Hushin. He is always loaded for bear with his New York breads. But we'll check out some more New York breads on the other side of this break. It's our first one here on Aqueduct Insider at MSG+. Plus. Stay tuned.
And that beautiful shot of the sun setting behind the Big A grandstand. Well, you are live with us here in the Big A studios on the second level here. Maggie Wolfnail, Andy Sterling for this edition of Aqueduct Insider on this Friday. We will jump right back into the racing action. It's race number seven. It was a claiming 20 open here for the Phillies and Mares going six furlongs. John Embrial once again with the seven. And they're off. In Kelly's defense, goes for the lead. Matching skies is running in second with the Wildcat Girl down at the rail in third. Easy passer on the outside is running in fourth. And my Donna Jean in fifth. Off my cloud is in sixth. Go Olivia Go in seventh. Cap of three. Perling is the trailer in eighth. Matching skies by a half length. Over in Kelly's defense, matching skies now by a full length in Kelly's defense. In pursuit in second to Wildcat Girl down at the rail in third. My Donna Jean on the outside in fourth, the quarter, 23 and three fifth seconds. Off my cloud is in fifth, about six lengths from the front. And then it's go Olivia go easy passer and purling and the field is at the top of the stretch with matching skies the one to catch half up in 47 and one matching skies a two and a half length lead in Kelly's defense in between horses my Donna Jean on the outside and a wildcat girl and now they're coming down for the 16th pole matching skies my Donna Jean on the outside here's my Donna Jean to take it right at the end and it was close for second between in Kelly's defense and matching skies well, give credit where credit is due here. My Donna Jean, Eddie Barker, had her ready to fire off the layoff. Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of credit to go around. The, the horse always deserves the most credit, Maggie. Correct. And, and she came back, and she refound her decent form from before. I don't think she ran her best race, but certainly better than she had been running. Eddie Barker, as you said, great job getting her back to decent form off the layoff if she had been running poorly. And let's give a little love to Fernando Hara. He yeah. came back here, and I think he's ridden very, very well. It's sort of quietly. He's yeah. trying to get more opportunities. And I think he gave the horse a very nice ride. She broke a little bit slowly, but I think in sensing the slow pace, because she's more of a closer, he kept her in the game. He kept her moving forward, and he never let the race get away from her. So as it became a grind in the stretch, she was able to grind out the victory. I think Fernando Hara did a very, very good job here. Yeah, exactly. And a filly or a mare who does appreciate the inner track. I had to think that Eddie did have that in mind as he did bring her back off of the layoff. But a pretty wide open affair in the next race, the eighth race. It was a A other than, and Johnny I has a call of the six furlong contest. Six miles, sprints out for the lead. A Jitney runs in second. Down at the rail is a Liberty Fuse in between horses is a privately speaking. And from the outside, it's sustainable racing in a fifth. Hey Kiddo is sixth. Followed by Flaring in seventh, the break of three to Irish Sweepstakes in eighth. Riding with the Devil is ninth. Kara's match point in tenth. Coast of Sangria trails the field in eleventh through an opening quarter mile that was sharp. Twenty-two and four-fifth seconds. Atlantic Smile on the lead here by two lengths. Jitney giving chase in second. Then it's Hey Kiddo in third. Liberty Fuse at the rail. Sustainables on the far outside. And the field is at the head of the lane. And it's Atlantic Smile in front, the half and 46 and one. Atlantic Smile's got a four length lead. Jitney, Hey Kiddo, Sustainable, all giving chase. Down towards the rail, it's flaring and Liberty Fuse, then privately speaking, and Irish Sweepstakes. But a clear cut winner here, Atlantic Smile, wire to wire. Privately speaking, up for second and a photo for third. Talk about sticking to the game plan. Ruben Silvera did just that with Atlantic Smile here today. He took no prisoners in taking the lead. No, I agree, Maggie. You know, this was a worst that I had liked, fortunately. Um, but knowing once she was able to clear the lead, because there was a lot of speed on paper, but, but Ruben did what he had to do. All he had to do was get to the front, and she did the rest. And Charlie Baker's done a great job with her. And, you know, Maggie, you watch her run, and you can't help but think about Dominic Lucio, of course, who used to train her, and Dominic passed away this year. And Atlantic Smile's a horse he did very well with, and Charlie's continued to do a good job with her. Charlie really does a great job. Big week uh, for him. Uh, it really has. And he does a great job year in and year out, no matter where he is. But, I mean, hitting at a high percentage right now for the inner track. Yeah. Yeah, winning the Garland of Roses on Saturday, and he's just his horses are really running well, and it's no surprise to us. No, he does a fantastic job. I always love the look of his horses in the paddock, at least from my perspective. But now we're going to check out the Furious Five, or 
last remaining five <laughs> races on this Friday card. Narrow lead over Little Gidding at the top of the stretch. Williams Lucky Gray at the rail. On the outside, it's Little Gidding. Little Gidding, now the leader. Williams Lucky Gray is back running in second until there was you in third. Little Gidding draws clear now by four lengths. Until there was you moves into second. Married to Michael on the outside. Little Gidding at four to five. Until there was you second. Then married to Michael and pitched. Now moving up. Mondor is fourth and under the whip. She's Marvy. On the outside, it's Bernstein Flambe. Mondor is third. Past the eighth pole. Here's Bernstein Flambe. And on the inside, she's Marvy. Continues to battle on Bernstein Flambe narrowly. She's Marvy. They come for the wire. Bernstein Flambe, the winner. She's Marvy was second. Then Mondor. And just at the sir. top of the stretch, Alkalite runs in second. It's four lengths. Back to Howell and Campion Lane, and then sideways vision. Old Upstart has opened up here. Less than an eighth of a mile to the finish. Old Upstart by almost five. Alkalite, a clear-cut second. It will be Old Upstart. Much the best. Alkalite second, and a photo for third between Campion Lane. To take the lead from Barbara Smile. Charming eyes in front. Barbara Smile down at the rail. Time for Harlan is gaining ground from third. Farther back, Gingy and Bella Facci. Charming eyes on the outside. It's time for Harlan. Charming eyes by ahead. Time for Harlan driving on the outside. Time for Harlan. Got there. Just in time. Charming eyes. It is a mineral water, but mineral water has a narrow lead. Little T. Louie in second. Bad to the own is third. Farther back, it's Leatherhead Lurie in fourth. Mineral water opens up in deep stretch. Mineral water, the odds on favorite. And it is Mineral Water and Manuel Franco to win going away. A three-way photo for second among Leatherhead Lurie, Little T. Louie, and Bad to the Roan. Well, finishing out the card in a bit of a chalky way, Andy, so no pick six carryover. No, and basically there were two horses covered. The favorite, obviously, uh, yeah. was the heavy favorite, and Kiali, who was 0 for 57 lifetime. I was thinking if that guy hit the pick six, Kiali, we should be erecting a statue up for him in the infield. <laughs> yeah, well, not involved in the pick six was race number three. It was a starter allowance for the two-year-olds. We saw a horse, Andy, come in here from out of town who was bet heavily, but it turned out it was the two New York horses battling it out. Well, we see that a lot, Maggie, and you're right, the third finisher not reproduced to form from parks. Interestingly enough, the horse who wins this race, Bernstein Flambe, comes out of a race where two horses, both Freudian and Billing, Billing Permit, had run, and they're running back in a stake race, I think the second or third race on Sunday, New York Breds, and this was a horse who was against the track. That was a track that got very inside late. Mm -hmm. In fact, it may have been the same day, I should look it up, that of course the winner of the eighth race had chased on the outside Maggie, and I think with Bernstein Flambe chasing outside the winner, Freudian, benefited from being on the rail, but building permit, who finished seven lengths in front of the, that winner, that third winner, was chasing on the outside even wider. And I think the building permit is a dangerous horse because of that trip. Well, I think these two today add on to another horse who won um, coming out of those last three races on that November 19th card that, you know, we saw the gate to wire kind of rail horses win. So that has been a really productive card. Well, the thing is, getting horses that had outside trips on the eighth race, because Atlantic Smile was one of those horses. We saw a horse that won earlier. And we've seen some horses. You want horses, especially the last three races on November 19th that had outside trips. Of course, one was the worst that hung badly in the stretch in the second race. <laughs> well, you know, you can't get them all no. there to the winner's circle. Uh, but one stallion that tends to get some to the winner's circle is Frost Giants, and he sponsors our New York Bread standout of the day, and I think that easily goes to Atlantic Smile Bre uh, beating uh, Open Company here. No, I agree very much, Dima. It was a good call picking her out. She beats Open Company. We saw some good New York brands. We certainly well, saw Global positioning, positioning, who but... ran very, very well, but this was a sensational performance by her, and, and Charlie really has her going well. You know, she was a horse that looked like she was more of a turf sprint type, mm -hmm. but ultimately I think she's turned into a pretty solid dirt horse. Exactly, with that kind of pedigree, a little more turf, but a daughter of Stormy Atlantic, but if you'd like to have a daughter of Frost Giant. Make sure you contact Eric Bishop. He's part of Sunrise Stallions. His contact info up there on your screen. Well, Andy, let's check out the jockey standings. We saw a lot of 
kind of jostling going around. And now we see Jose Ortiz and Manny Franco tied with 11. I won't be surprised to see these two guys battling out the whole way. Angel Cruz has been riding exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. He's going to have a good winter. And you look at that group, and obviously Arad's going to pick it up. He was out of town. He was in Hong Kong and missed some opportunities. But looking at that group, Karina Velasquez is injured. He'll be back probably sometime in January. It's a pretty solid group for the winter. I think those riders are pretty much all riding well. Dylan Davis riding well. Ruben Sierra. Silvera is an improved yeah. rider. I think we've got a nice group here for the winter. Yeah, and Angel Cruz, whose agent is Billy Castle, benefits a lot from riding from <laughs> our leading trainer, David Jacobson, who leads uh, with two wins over Gary Contessa. I think David's probably safe that he'll be leading throughout the winter. Yeah, uh, I think that. In I starters bet and winners. That. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but it was a hot day in the claim box, that's for sure. Here Andy, I think we might have, do we have two pages? We may, uh, but there's a lot of shakes actually going on. Uh, it was a more interesting thing. Eight ways on the Wildcat Girl. Well, I guess they got they claimed her for 17.5, so they got some money. They got their yeah. money back plus some. And two, there was you, was claimed backed by Gary Contessa in the first race. Interesting claim of Barbara Smile. Yeah. I don't know that I would have claimed anybody out of that race, but I guess they're looking for interesting horses. Yeah, and maybe she goes to Florida for George Weaver a little bit, maybe a little bit better on the turf. Off my cloud, 10 way shake by Barbara Barbera picks up her. It is break time. It's our final one on this Aqueduct Insider. We'll see you. Maybe the sun will be set as we return off the other side of this break. To say the least, we are open though this coming Monday, December 15th, and then we take a bit of a holiday break. Christmas for you, Hanukkah, Andy, but we'll be back on uh, uh, December 26th. Yeah, it's nice to have a little bit of a break. I was looking through that Monday card. It's a pretty good card. A it lot is. of big fields on Monday's mm. card, so we're going out the right way. We have that 10-day break. I'll be spending a little time in Saratoga, heading out of Maryland a little bit. Yes, I am. Uh, visiting families, as we all like to do during the holidays. Uh, but we have some racing to get to, and tomorrow's card is very good. We always get some good two-year-old races, or at least made in special weight fields, and obviously there'll be three-year-olds moving forward. But the second does go as just that, going six furlongs. A horse who has experience, as we'll see, finishing second here is Saratoga Wildcat. Yeah, we usually give a little bit of an edge to the ones with experience, and based at least on buyer figures, Saratoga Wildcat is the horse to beat the 73 buyer and finishing a distant second last time. But it's interesting, the other horse in this race that has experience is King Rontos mm. coming off the turf. Rudy Rodriguez turning back after a turf race. And King Rontos, actually, if you use the time form figures, they think this horse is faster. In fact, that race at Belmont Park, the last time in the dirt, was a very fast pace that he was chasing in there. And I think he is the worst to be the one that's a run. It, it was, and King Rontos, he definitely has a seasoning. Ones that don't, though, are a couple good-looking, at least on paper, uh, first-time starters from the Kieran McLaughlin barn is Ocean Knight, and here a $320,000 uh, OBS purchase as a two-year-old. Don't necessarily see this that much, but for Stone Street, comes in with some decent breezes, is a son of Curlin. Yeah, actually, the dam was a Billy Turner horse that was a sprinter, and she had some speed, yeah. so we'll see if this one gets some speed from the dam. I thought the first show that was more interesting might be Corton here, who's actually a half the very speedy console at Turf Spinner Due Diligence, or that had been purchased by Todd Pletcher and company after a big win in Saratoga. It's a little more turfy, yet they leave the horse up here. Maybe they don't want to run against those Todd Pletcher killers down in Florida, and the purses are very good, better than they are for the maidens down in Florida. Why not? Well, also, he's a full brother to Bamada, not quite as the class of those two aforementioned ones, but he's still in dirt. <laughs> <laughs> he does have five wins to his credit, but he does have more of the dirt pedigree. But we'll turn the page and move on to tomorrow's seventh race. And still A other than going six furlongs. And we'll see Chapman here setting the pace back on Super Saturday uh, to be defeated by Noble Cornerstone. Yeah, I mean, Noble Cornerstone is obviously a, a good horse. And yes, losing to him is no disgrace <laughs> whatsoever. He's able to set a very slow pace here. <laughs> there isn't a heck of a lot of speed in this race, no. Maggie. So you yes. have to think the connection to Chapman. you got Cece Lopez. They're looking 
this and the front. And to argue that he's not the horse in this beat in this race to beat is foolish. Right, and he's three for six on the aqueduct in there. Well, we saw a successful return to the races for Ultra Oro for Linda Rice here. Kind of showed a new dimension. He turned back to six furlongs in the slop. Got it done in a dead heat, though. He did, but he was riding the best part of the racetrack. He had an absolutely perfect trip, and he's just not fast enough to beat a horse like Chapman. Unless he's dramatically improved, and it, he didn't really like the wet track, and he can improve in his second start, which I suppose isn't impossible. He's going to have his hands full beating Chapman, who also has a tactical edge on him. He truly does. Well, a bit of a wild card is the lightly raced war hero. We'll go back uh, a long way, almost a year ago here, to the 26th of December. Very professional, though, in breaking his maiden. He was. It was a lesser field. His last race down in Maryland, which was back in March, back, what, yeah. eight months ago? Nine, over nine months ago, actually. Had a little trouble in there. He wasn't that good. Chad Brown's numbers with his returning turf sprinters, his percentage are pretty good, but they always get over bet. I think Spartiatus, if you want a long shot in here, Spartiatus for the great. Leon Blushowitz could be the dangerous horse, at least to be second to Chapman. Well, the thing you always have to worry about, though, with Blue's horses is your price. I guarantee he likes them. That is one thing I obviously won't bet against either. But on to the future. It's the $100,000 Queens County Stakes. Nine furlongs, three and up. Checking out Vijack as well as El Nawi. We're going back a long way to the 2013 Gotham. Yeah, this is one where I liked El Nawi out of the race. I think we talked about it on Trips and Traps, and I was wrong. <laughs> he really isn't that good. He's not impossible in here. He draws the rail. He has that look of a Kieran horse that will get over bet. Vijak, we talked about it before, Maggie. Can he get the mile and an eighth? I'm against that, but one that show, has shown that he can is Storm and Monarco here. We're checking out the Swatara Stakes and him winning down at Penn National. You know, you know, you look at him, and he has run well enough in New York. It's not like there's that big a difference, Mag, between his races out of town in New York. That race when he was second in the Alidar in Saratoga, whatever happened to Farhan, ran so well in that race. Oh, that yeah. race would make him tough in here. I think he's very much one of the main players, as is this horse. He does. I mean, he runs fast fares, but micromanage here in the... One mile and five eighths, uh, or three, is it five eighths or three quarters? Something like Two that. Two miles, eight miles, this is Whatever. three quarters. It's right? a marathon, but he blew this field open. Yeah, he's sort of a turn back, right? Because he yes. really wants to go about eight <laughs> miles. And I know he ran okay in his turf debut. He's much more of a dirt horse. You wonder, is this race a little short for him to show his best stuff? Uh, obviously, he's a player, and you know what? So is his entry mate, Miss Connect. Yep. He didn't want to run this horse for a tag, because I think Bruce Levine felt he deserved a chance in this race before they put him in for the price. Exactly. He must have seen something in the morning, came back with a nice win as well. Andy, thank you for accompanying me My here pleasure. on this Aqueduct Insider. For him, I'm Maggie Wolfendale, and hopefully you'll see the usual crew back in these seats. Lovely view of the Empire State Building to close things out on this edition of Aqueduct Insider here on MSG+. Good night, everybody.